You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is the last day of February 2022. Well, you know, I'm always big on investing in human capital, investing in yourself and finding additional sources of income, income streams, be they passive or otherwise. And I've come across somebody who really is the expert when it comes to this, to the side hustle. He's been doing it for years. He's teaching you how to do it. His name is Nick Loper. Nick, uh, your website, Side Hustle Nation. I see you used to work for food. Then you used to work for money. Now you're working for freedom. How's that working out for you? Uh, so far, so good. It's been a it's been a long journey to get here, but it's been a lot of fun along the way. Um, showcasing the stories of other successful side hustler entrepreneurs at this point through the side hustle show, closing in on 500 episodes. I don't think it's quite as uh, quite as prolific as yours, but we're uh, we're on our way. Well, I assume at some point in your personal history, you were an employee. Yeah, I did what you're supposed to do straight out of school. Got a, a big boy corporate job and just had no desire to climb the corporate ladder there or or elsewhere. So trying to uh, claw my way out of there. And for me, it was a comparison shopping site for footwear, which was a super random niche and was not a sneakerhead and had no real interest in the product, but had a lot of interest in you know, the behind the scenes, uh, marketing and optimization and all that stuff was a ton of fun. And that was the vehicle after three years of nights and weekends that let me turn in the keys to the company car and say, uh, see you later. All right. Well, you mentioned escaping the rat race. It always, one thing always stuck in my mind. Somebody once told me that even if you get to the top of the rat race, you win it, you're still a rat. That's right. You got to figure out a way, at least in my case. I mean, and, and, for full disclosure, like I got plenty of friends who are making great money at their nine to five jobs. Like they, they are not, it's not necessarily on their radar, the entrepreneurial alternative or looking for something else like, Hey, you know, things are okay. And we're getting by and we're saving some money and that's, and that's their path. And that's totally fine. But it just, it just wasn't mine. And for a lot of uh, readers and listeners of the side hustle show, it's kind of the same way looking for, there's, there's gotta be something else out there. And it's funny because as an employee, you know, all businesses are constantly looking to reduce costs. Any responsible business owner is doing that. That's part of your ongoing responsibilities. What is your leading source of costs? It's going to be your employees and contractors. So by nature, any employee is always subject to being a cost to be cut, a cost to be controlled. And if you're working for somebody and I'm not saying that we can't all be uh, entrepreneurs or maybe we can, but we're not uh, a lot of you out there aren't cut out to be that, but the side hustle works for non entrepreneurs. Doesn't it, Nick? Well, this is a way to dip your toes into the entrepreneurial waters in a low risk way and low risk, low time investment. And that's something that I wasn't necessarily hearing, you know, the narrative, you know, the, early 2010s entrepreneurial narrative was, uh, you know, an entrepreneur is somebody who, you know, jumps off the cliff and figures out how to build their parachute on the way down, which I think is like a Reed Hoffman quote from LinkedIn. It's like, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> it's like, that's not realistic for most people. Like, Hey, look, we got responsibilities. We've got jobs. We've got kids. We've got mortgages. Uh, we got bills to pay. Like we're not jumping off any cliffs here, but it's like, okay, could we, you know, start to take some steps toward this entrepreneurial path and do it nights and weekends? If, if that's something that is interesting, you, if it's something that appeals to you. And so let's talk about one very common side hustle that uh, many of you out there are doing, and that is driving for Uber, say, or yeah. Lyft. Uh, can you make any money really doing that, Nick? Uh, I think there have been some studies to suggest that your earning power is quite low, um, almost depressingly so after you're accounting for, you know, vehicle depreciation and expenses. The 
the appeal here is like, I look at these kind of as almost a short-term stopgap. Like if I need to make an extra thousand bucks to, you know, pay off this credit card or to fund some emergency expense that popped up, like these are very plug and play, right? You know, low barrier to entry, um, easy to get started with. And like my, you know, I had an Uber driver in Chicago or a Lyft driver in Chicago. When I need to make money, I turn on the app. And so it's very straightforward and appealing in that way. But because it's a skill that, just about everybody has, you know, you're, there's a ceiling to your earning power and you can project out into the future with self-driving cars, like where this is going. Um, so it's it, it definitely a viable option, but you have to kind of project out even in your, in your own life. Like if, could I see myself doing this for five years? Like, and does that get me really materially closer to the goals and the lifestyle that I'm wanting to have? And for some people, yes, for some people, no. Okay. What about say Airbnb? Uh, yeah, <laughs> you live in a jurisdiction that you can do it. Like in New York City, you have to be in the apartment. To, you can't uh, rent an apartment or buy a condo and then rent it out to Airbnb. They passed rules against that. Is that a viable side hustle? Yeah, I would lump Airbnb similarly, kind of in this you know plug and play, like these different marketplaces, like gig economy marketplaces, Airbnb, Task Rabbit, right? go where the cash is already flowing. And in this case, Airbnb has the eyeballs. There's plenty of cash flowing on that platform, but you're kind of in the, uh, in the crosshairs of a lot of municipalities. Well, we don't really like the short-term rental game. And you were putting a strain on, especially in tight rental markets, you're putting a strain on like what would be maybe long-term uh, rental inventory. So you're driving rents up. So there's a lot of nuance in that space. Now that said, people have done really well with that. And if you have a spare bedroom, if you have, we've seen people, you know, I used to live in the Bay Area in California, we saw people renting out tents in their backyard in like, you know, these wealthy suburbs for like 80 bucks a night or something. So there's some creative ways to, uh, to get around it, but uh, not without risk in a lot of cases. So if you're buying property specifically for the sake of Airbnb, got to make sure it pencils as a long-term rental, just in case the rug gets pulled out from under you with some uh, law changes or something. Hey, just as a funny story and aside, a friend of mine bought a house uh, far larger than she needed. And she had also bought another home, Airbnb in it, and it was in demand, like instantly, like nonstop, 97% occupancy. Wow. Well, just knocking down the doors. It's well located in Florida. And what she did was she basically put a wall down the middle of her house and put in a kitchenette and a, a washer, washer dryer stackable and pretty much made half her house an Airbnb. And the thing is getting like close to $200 a night. The yeah. That portion, it's it's like a three bedroom, two bath. And that portion of the house uh, is is occupied virtually nonstop. And yeah, it's a little bit uh, scary to open up your home to people perhaps in that manner, but she's taken the necessary measures for security. So it's all good. Uh, but there's certainly opportunity. So your personal favorite side hustles, Nick, why don't you share those with us? Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Gold Terra Resource Corp. is a gold exploration company that has assembled a highly prospective district-scale land position on the doorstep of the city of Yellowknife in Canada's Northwest Territories. Gold Terra is currently focused on expanding and delineating gold resources at the company's Yellowknife City Gold Project with the goal of discovering over 5 million ounces. With ready access to infrastructure and multiple high-grade gold discoveries, Gold Terra is on track to re-establishing Yellowknife as one of the premier gold mining districts in Canada. Gold Terra trades as YGT in Toronto and YGTFF on the OTC. For more information, go to goldterracorp.com. That's goldterracorp.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Yeah, so I'm thinking in terms of like, what can I build that has a little bit of leverage beyond hours for dollars that has some potential to scale? And for me, that's usually some sort of online business in the um, audience building space or in the content building space where, like yourself, like we're creating podcasts, we're doing YouTube video, we're doing blog content, right? Where I can create something once and it can hopefully live on the internet for years and years and years and 
attract people and attract revenue and attract email signups. So I like that type of business model. Uh, maybe that's an email newsletter, which is something we've seen some people doing some exciting stuff there. I mean, Airbnb certainly qualifies because it's like, well, here's an asset and maybe even a leveraged asset that you know, now is kind of decoupled from your time, especially now if you have uh, uh, an outsourced cleaning service that comes in and helps with the, the turnover. But those are the ones that I'm most excited about, something with a little bit of leverage. So uh, among those, um, in my experience, has been these content-based websites like Side Hustle Nation, where it's like trying to write um, evergreen content that people can discover and hopefully get value from for years and years trying to create podcast episodes where it takes the same amount of effort to record the episode if 10 people listen or if 10,000 people listen. Right. So it, it, that's the, you know, more speculative work up front Cause it's like, well, I'm not getting paid to do this in the hopes of, you know, outpacing my day job salary down the road. But those are the types of models that are most exciting to me right now. An interesting story about that. 11 years ago, my son had a job in a ski shop part time. I didn't force him to do it. He just wanted to work, which is great. Work, build work ethic in the kids. And he really got tired of it. So he found a couple of online sites where they pay people for content. And he was writing research, basically just looking up stuff on Google and writing. And he's a fairly decent writer. He was young and not as good as he is now, obviously, but he was making about a hundred. Uh, one was called uh, textbroker.com, I think. He was uh -huh. making a hundred bucks a week writing articles. And he, the, you got ratings from one to five, and he was a four. And so that you got paid X amount per word. And the kid was making a hundred dollars, a uh, hundred dollars a week on average. And that was gas money. You know, yeah. going out having fun money. So if he could do it at 17, I got to believe uh, any of you out there can do it. So if you were uh, somebody and you need, like, say, to make $300 a week more or 500, where do you go? How do you find the opportunities, Nick? Yeah, I like this service-based operation too. Like, you know, it could be as simple as sticking your flag in the sand and saying, hey, I'm a freelance writer now. I'm going to go to town. And I've paid people several times that for just one article. And so there's demand out there from publications to uh, buy content or accelerate the content production process from qualified writers. So that's definitely uh, a way to go. One interesting model that I'm excited about these days is what I'll call drop servicing, which is essentially, um, you know, you being the middleman between, you're playing connector between the service provider and the customer. And so we've seen people do this in the online space in SEO and uh, graphic design and, you know, kind of things that can be done remotely. But where the bigger opportunity, I think, is is in lo local, local services, home-based services, because I just think the entrenched competition is still playing the game. Like it's 1998 and you see these, you know, outdated websites. If they have a website at all, that's like, you know, almost rare. It's you see stuff like, you know, fax us for a quote and like all of that is a good sign. It's like, this is a market is ripe for disruption. Um, we had a guy. You might, recently, well, you might as well be using a telegraph if you're using a fax nowadays, right? Yeah. It's like, no, just make it easy for the, you know, millennial homeowner who's used to one click Amazon ordering. Like, no, just tell me how much it's going to be, when you're going to show up, be professional and make it seamless. So we had a guy, actually college student, I re recorded with him on his last day of college had built a window cleaning business in Southern California to $700,000 in revenue. Wow. And it was just by playing this game, like how can I, you know, connect with customers? And it was, you know, I can be a better marketer and a better administrator than a lot of the existing competition and go out and find guys who know how to clean windows, not rocket science. And he's done really well, really well with that. And I think he now is like replicating that same model into you know, a uh, home cleaning service and some other spaces. So it's, uh, I, I get inspiration just driving around town, looking at the signs I see on people's trucks. It's like, oh, I didn't know that was a niche. Like, oh, it could be gutter cleaning or tree pruning or pressure washing. Or uh, we had another guest on doing pet waste removal. It's like, uh, it's not the most glamorous uh, business, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> hey, I had a concept. I don't want to do it, but let me share with you this. You know, Restaurants have a real hard time often keeping their restrooms clean and nothing will turn off a patron at a restaurant more than a unclean restroom. Yeah. Nothing. 
Because if you say, well, the bathroom is this dirty, what's the kitchen look like? So my concept was to have a service in a restaurant district where you provide the cleaning staff who goes in to each restroom once an hour, twice an hour, cleans it out, loads up the uh, paper goods, the paper towels, the toilet paper. And therefore they don't have, you know, because nobody who works for the place wants to clean the bathroom, right? Yeah. That's the least, that is like, uh, you've really done something wrong when the boss says, hey, go clean the bathrooms out. And, you know, you could just do that and you could get 30, 40 restaurants. They probably pay you a couple hundred bucks a month to do it. Right. And then you go hire the people, the cleaners to do it. Yeah. I'm thinking of like the gas lamp district in San Diego or something where they're all like stacked up right next to yeah. each other. It's like, yeah, you could just, you know, rotate through kind of like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Like, you know, once you get to the end of the block, OK, go start over and, and work your way down again. And you can have an app. So if something happens and they have an emergency, they need it cleaned up. They uh, they send the uh, a text message through the app to the cleaner and they go right over there and it gets addressed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So literally dirty jobs can be a great side hustle. <laughs> For sure. I think there's some opportunity there. Like we had, um, you know, like attic cleaning, like in the little Valpac mailers, we get these like duct cleaning, attic cleaning, like dryer vent. Uh, clean outs kind of stuff that, you know, okay, as a homeowner, you recognize ah, I probably should be doing this stuff, but I don't really want to bother it. If somebody made it easy for me to do that, and then, you know, maybe they stacked up, you know, six or seven on uh, on a weekend or something, you know, through the neighborhood, they're probably doing pretty well. We had a guy whose uh, son was going door to door, you know, trying to trying to sell like lawn mowing services. And he's getting a bunch of no's. It's like, well, I, I either already have a lawnmower, like I'm doing it myself or I already have a service for this. Like, I appreciate your hustle, son, but that's not, that's not going to work. So he changed his pitch to, oh, I'll do lawn aeration. And now for most people, it's like, oh, you know, when was the last time your lawn was aerated? Like, I don't know. And so now they roll up to Home Depot and rent the machine. So they pre-sold all these services, you know, go rent the machine for 200 bucks or something and turn around and sold a thousand bucks worth of services on one Saturday afternoon. I thought that was a pretty cool way to do it with a really low, low risk. They didn't have, you didn't even have the equipment going, going into it. That's great. Yeah. I saw another one that popped up recently and basically you pay them 40 bucks a month and they power wash your decks and your driveway. And uh, I guess for an additional fee, your backyard patio, whatever. Okay. Okay. Like, because normally you do that stuff maybe once, twice a year, and the place is grungy up until the time you do it. But if you have somebody doing it regularly, the place sparkles, you know, yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And you're setting yourself up for recurring revenue on the service provider side. We had a guy who, you know, that was his thing, you know, big, big yard signs all around town. We wash houses, you know, with his phone number and this, you know, he had the pressure washing equipment. He's like, oh, we got to use pressure washer for 200 bucks. Charge my first customer 200 bucks. And it's like, okay, I'm off to the races after this. That's great. And you can always rent them too. Yeah, it's great. So you're only limited by your imagination. And there is a whole world of services that people need, but you don't know you need it until you discover that somebody's offering it, right? Uh, there's an element of, of that. Well, especially if you can get you know one customer in the neighborhood and then all the other neighbors see that this guy's getting that done. And they're like, oh, you know, that. <laughs> we had another um, guest on the show who's doing like mobile car detailing. And was, I, his soundbite that stuck with me was like, for most of our customers, it's their first time ever getting their car detailed. Like, this is a great gift to yeah. give to your wife or husband. And that to me signaled like a growing uh, pie, a growing industry where it's like, well, if it's most people's first times, like, okay, it's not necessarily about going out and conquesting market share from an existing service provider, just that the pie keeps getting bigger and you can kind of wedge your toe in there and very effective. You know, they see you out in the driveway doing your thing. Like, Hey, do you have a, do you have a business card? You know, what are you doing after this? Can you come, come by, give me a quote. It happens all the time. Yeah, it's great. Hey, I mean, I've used a guy who, uh, when I need new tires, uh, he's got a mobile tire setup thing in the back of his truck in his trailer and he comes over 
you ship the tires to him from like tire rack or someplace like that. He gets the tires, schedules it, costs a little more than going to the tire place. But I don't know about you, Nick, but I cannot stand going to a tire place, especially now they're all short staffed. It takes them, you know, all day you have to leave your car there. You can't wait around like you did before. So this guy comes to your house within, and because he's entrepreneur motivated, he, changes your tires and balances them about five times faster than they do at the tire store. And great thing. Well, I think uh, we made the point, Nick, that you're only limited by your imagination and there's a whole world out there. Uh, just tell us again how we connect with you on the web and uh, how we find out more about what you're doing. Hey, you bet. So uh, we'd love to have you tune into the Side Hustle Show and your favorite podcast app. Um, sidehustlenation.com slash ideas is a good place to start if you prefer text. And that will uh, hopefully by the time you scroll down to the bottom of this page, uh, you know, no opt-in required over there. You got eight or 10 different browser tabs open and say like, oh, I want to learn more about this. That sounds interesting. So just to get the uh, creative juices flowing for you. All right. And you've got like some nice ideas on the site. I'm just looking at it now. Excellent. Hey, any questions for Nick? Just shoot me an email, kl at kerryletz.com. Don't forget, go over to the site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com and make sure you sign up for your free newsletter. Nick, been a pleasure. Good luck. Keep hustling. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, sir. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.